Welcome to the Managing the Smart Mind podcast with your shamelessly smart host, coach, Elsa Kramer. This is episode 95, Super Connecting Through Lego with Dr. Kate Raines Goldie. Hello, smart human. This is the week in which Lego organizes World Play Day which means it is the perfect time to treat you to an earlier interview I did with Dr. Kate Raines Goldie. She is an amazing human being and like me, she loves Lego. (laughs) So there's going to be some Lego talk on this podcast. She is an an award-winning human connection designer, a PhD trained business and cultural anthropologist, super fun, She is also a keynote speaker, strategist, um, so many other things. But, you know, what is most important, I think, for you to take away from this interview, in addition to her being the creator of an amazing new method called Super Connect, is how she uses her gifts, her different interests, her talents, and the power of connection to create a new life-changing method, right? To basically add something amazing to the world. So some stuff we talk about is, of course, (laughs) the power of play, the importance of building trust and safety, the way we do need to keep stepping out of our comfort zones, neurodivergence, creating tools for leaders, innovation, curiosity, the power of facilitation, how important it is to stay active to feel good, both mentally and physically. We talk about AI in society and much, much more. So if you'd like to learn more about, first of all, how to create something amazing in the world, second, about Lego Serious Play and Super Connect, tune in. And learn from Dr. Kate Raines Gold. All right, smart humans. I am utterly delighted for so many reasons to have on the podcast today as a guest, Dr. Kate. And you can finish because I haven't actually <laughs> memory. Reynolds? Reigns Gold. Reigns, right? Yeah, I can't... People always get stuck with the Reigns. <laughs> Reigns, Dr. Kate Reigns. Um, and we're going to start, we're going to dive right in because Dr. Kate loves to play. <laughs> we'll get to that later. <laughs> Who told <But> I, you? <laughs> I always love to start with the question, what is your biggest frustration? Oh, wow. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What we go straight in it. Oh, I have to think about that. What is my biggest frustration? Okay. That that you could just go so many different ways with that. Um, there isn't a right answer, I'm sure. <laughs> I, well, I'm trying, the answer that comes to I'm trying to think of the biggest one. Okay, maybe one let's say biggest... we need more fun. We need more play. Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. and more connection. I think that's, you know, like it's the first thing I was going to say is like something really boring, like not being on time, but I'm not on time. <laughs> maybe that's why it bothers <laughs> me so much. Um, but really, I think it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's more fun. And, yeah. I just saw the Barbie movie last night with my partner and his his daughter. He's nine. And if you haven't seen it, I won't say too many spoilers, but there's this beautiful scene towards the end where all the executives, it's kind of like everybody's having their cathartic moment of the revelation of what, you know, what they need to learn at the end yeah. of the movie. And their whole thing is like, we need to dance and sing and have fun and, and hug each other. And I was right. like, yes, <laughs> they, yes, they agree, right? Yeah. Totally. It's so funny because whenever I am in like, whether it's a training or some other environment, I will always be like, guys, why why aren't we having fun? <laughs> but like, not that we yeah. shouldn't be serious and apply ourselves, but you know, learning gets to be fun. And it's so, I'm sure you know more about this than I do. It's so much more effective when it's fun yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 And it's not just, I think, fun in the sense of like, let's go on a, a roller coaster. And I'm thinking about that beautiful Lego model you have. Yes. <laughs> but it's, you know, what brings you joy and purpose? Um, and I was working with a client this morning and that was part of the conversation is 
Um, I really like to work with go givers rather than go getters. Mm. And I think the difference in that is you want to like part of the joy is doing something that makes you feel happy and brings you joy and it's your passion, but also you're helping other people to make a difference. Yes. And so even if, you know, fun is, it's like, what's your fun? What brings you joy? What brings you happiness? And it doesn't have to be like, oh, I need to do the stereotypical fun, but something that's like, I really love exactly. spreadsheets. If you love spreadsheets and that's fun for you, then that's, you know, that's what we need. Yeah. Exactly. Like no judgment. Like I don't like parties with loud music. <laughs> and no, but seriously, for, for years, I thought, oh, I have to celebrate if, if I, if I've got something, you know, to celebrate whether it's in my business or in my life, I need to go to a cafe and a bar and like be around loud music and have alcohol. And a couple of years ago, I realized that's not necessary at all. <laughs> that's just a made up thing that lots of people enjoy that. But I really don't. So mm -hmm. I can make up my own way to celebrate. What what gives you joy? What makes you happy? Well, Is it I, spreadsheets? I add to that. No, it's not spreadsheets. <laughs> but I get joy in people who love spreadsheets so they can you know, do the spreadsheet stuff that I don't have to do. And then I'm yeah. happy, but I also wanted to just to, to jam on what you were saying about, you know, what's your fun. It's also not having the should. So it's yes. like, I should find this fun. If you don't, then don't, you know, that, we, that should is so powerful to get rid of. I have an so entire go, podcast episode on this. <laughs> <laughs> like It's called yeah. the word you're never allowed to use again. <laughs> yeah. I think so yeah. Like I agree. That. I think that's yeah. so good. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, for me, I think doing things that is not what I should be doing, but what I actually do to sing mm. with your next question, but actually makes me happy and, and gives it's my passion. And I'd say it's really about connecting people and helping them to be curious. And that's where the play comes in, because I think play gets a bad rap, but it's really powerful for doing those two things for the outcome. Like play is how you get there. Yeah. But the outcome is connection and, and curiosity and connection and, and curiosity feeds back into connection and you know how we boost bringing people together and being curious and all of the good things that come out of those things so, so tell me more about yeah. how you do that because you can't sort of wake up in the morning and think okay you know connection brings me joy yeah let's get some connection <laughs> <laughs> how do you do that yeah what's it uh, look one like of my favorite tools um well my background one of the many things I've done in my life is game design so not physical world I mean not video games but physical world games so almost like escape rooms oh, that you would play so, so like maybe Pokemon Go is sort of the closest okay I um, just analogy. started playing that again <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because people were doing that's coming back yep um but what I really loved about that was um was how it was a tool to bring people together and to explore um different concepts and explore understanding each other and um just as like a tool for something other than just play, even though play is great in itself. Yeah. Um, but it really brought me to understand that what I really was interested in was community and connection mm. and how that by not being about that was about that. And that's how I came into Lego serious play, which is one of my favorite tools for connection, um, which it wasn't actually designed for it's, you know, it was a, a um, to a tool developed by two European business professors and the Lego group for strategy and mm -hmm. bus improving business outcomes. But I think the secret of it is that it does build connection yeah, and it does create authentic connection. It builds trust and it, it allows people to be vulnerable together. And in doing that, you're able to really, when people feel heard and seen and safe, they're able to, to share, to have, you know, better conversations about the things that really matter Absolutely. And so it's again, it's like connections great in itself, but it also enables all of these things. And so my take and my my passion with it is using something that seems very simple and almost deceptively simple. And at the end of a session, people are just like, how did you know, how did that happen? It's almost like magic. So what does that and... look like? Because I'm sure everybody who's listening is wondering, yeah. like, OK, so you get people in a room and you give them Lego bricks. I mean, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's like, like I can totally picture this, but maybe not everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so it's not, you're not, um, and I like to, I've started using the word create rather than build mm -hmm. because like what it. you're creating with Lego is you're not building cars and buildings and perfect things. You're built, you're creating metaphor and story and feeling. Yes. And so you're that's not trying to create a replica of something in the world. 
No, no. And so if people come and say, oh, I'm not creative or, you know, where are the instructions? I'm, I'm feeling really intimidated at where are the instructions on what to build. And it's not like that at all. It's really about almost like you can think about it as a, almost a meditation practice or a grounding mm. practice. And you're thinking with your hands. And I was just whatever. about to say, <laughs> yeah, thinking with your hands. Totally. Yeah. It's very different. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you're putting things together, so the, the first, you're almost like, I like to call it an initiation when you're coming into this new way of creating with Lego, it's build a tower with you in it that says something about you. And so that's a, mm-hmm. an adaptation from a Michael Fern, who was my certifier, um, who did my certification in Lego Serious Play, but that was adapted from the original, um, which is slightly different. I'm not sure what it was, but it's all, you know, um, evolving and iterating. And that's what's great about the method in general. We can get into that, but yeah, and I'm sure all the all the people it. who do this like <laughs> yeah. are constantly improving yeah. because they have smart minds and they love yeah. to innovate, right? <laughs> and it's open source, so you can. Like, yes. What other facilitation method can you do that? So, so you get good. beautiful things like that where it's whatever a table or but that's another one I like to use, build a table with you on it that says something about you. It's all kind of metaphorical archetype prompts. Yep. But it's build a tower with you in it. And so what a tower is, what you in it, any of those things can mean anything. There's no right or wrong. And so people will create totally different things. Yeah. And sometimes people will build upside down, which is where the, the studs are on the bottom, which is there's that's not actually upside down in, in Lego serious play. Um, and the things that come out of that, um, I've had people that I've worked with and just that one question, which is a throwaway question. It's just the initiation. It's not actually getting into the meat of it. Things will be revealed to them that are like, wow, I didn't even realize that that was something I need to pay attention I to. I seriously want to do that day. today. Yeah. Military. Yeah. Like I see what, what yeah. my hands will make basically. Yeah. 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 It's also a way of like letting the subconscious talk, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But and in a very there, accessible can... way rather than um, having people sort of, I don't know, drawing can be in, like incredibly intimidating to people here you have kind of the building blocks to let your subconscious do the talking but exactly. without having to be like I need a specific skill yeah you don't have to be good at drawing you don't have to be good at you can be creative without having the almost the the skill that what's not it's almost like a um I'm trying to think of the word but it's almost like the functional skill you don't need to have all this you know these extra things to be able to articulate yourself exactly you with these pre-made bricks that are already quite amazing and i love and, this because uh, my, my next card is trust <laughs> yes that's great <laughs> so like how do you build the trust that people are actually dare to build a tower with them in it like as in this yeah. is a deeply personal i mean as an icebreaker it's pretty you know courageous yeah. Yeah. And it, that's so because it's an open source method, my my joy with it is that I can add to it and evolve it. And so I have a particular add on called Super Connect, which is by the name, what the name implies is all about connection. And I'm really interested in how do you create psychological safety and how do you create vulnerability? So I've added in things because this this method was developed in the 90s. Right. Right. And so the time it was a very different time for a whole bunch of different reasons. Like it was before COVID. Um shoulder pads. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they were thinking about, you know, psychological safety and mental health, maybe as much as we are now. Um so one of the things is really about um consent. So mm-hmm. making sure that, you know, you can share as much or as little as you want. Right. So one what so when you build something or create something, if you something gets revealed to you you don't have to share it you can just say this is my model and this is what that's it that's that's all you have to say or you can share as much as you want another thing is there's no bystanders Mm. so no one's watching everybody has to participate but again that participation is you share as much or as little as you want yeah so it's those two things that i think are really important and there's other things you can do around um inclusivity and how you design your sessions and how you design your workshops to make sure that people are included from the get-go. So I always like to ask uh, when people sign up for my facilitator training, things like, is there anything that we can do so that you feel the most comfortable and most able to learn? Okay, so this that's is a really open-ended okay, hang on. It's an invitation. <laughs> Everybody listening who facilitates, can you please add this like today? <laughs> I mean, seriously, yeah. that is such a great question. Yeah. Right, people are like, 
I mean, I've just been to an event and and being autistic and having ADHD, I I have I have special needs. Let's face it, yeah. right? Like, yeah. so it's amazing if organizers are willing to, even if they can't accommodate everything, which I can understand sometimes. Just them asking makes such a massive difference. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it's also really hard to ask when you have, you know, there's things that you're constantly having to fight to get your needs met, and it's like yeah. this exhaustion. And if someone's just inviting you to share as much as you want about what you need, and then it's even often, in fact, I think every single time I've I've, I've adjusted something, it's made it better for everybody. So even that. if it's just dietary, it's like dietary stuff is is like the most basic thing, but never gets accommodated. Well, not never, but like for, it's the, quite rare. for the amount of people that have stuff, dietary stuff, it's not accommodated yeah. as well as it could be. And that's like a really basic thing. And it's just, if you go to an event that's about inclusivity or about something, and it's like, I feel like the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. And yes. so it's like the whole event needs to be aligned. And making sure that it's aligned with what you're trying to do is so important. Even if it's just making sure that everybody gets their food accommodated yeah, is a huge thing. So totally. I think yeah. the whole accommodations, <laughs> I love that you're saying that like all the accommodations, same, like in the workspace, so many things people are asking for, like neurotypical people will be like, yeah, I want that too. Like that yeah. would be amazing. <laughs> but I just so want quick... to guard the dietary stations at events, yeah. right? There's like people guarding it. So the other people don't come and take all the special food. So exactly. Yeah, the thing. Yeah. Exactly. That was what it was like actually at this men's event. You needed like a special sign on your badge to go to the, the dietary yeah, the special, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to go back to trust and ask you about how, like, what is it like for you personally? How have you built self-trust? Because you're out there in the world, right? Mm. You seem pretty confident how did you have you were you born that way how did you build <laughs> <No>. it <laughs> definitely not um I think it's a lot a lot of work a lot of work on myself mm -hmm. um how did I do that I mean I think yeah just a lot of I think a lot of practice and doing I have a game of um doing things that scare me so okay it's like if hang on like are you like clairvoyant so the next card is challenging yourself I love it yeah, when this happens <laughs> um and wow. I don't play it so much now because I, I think it's done its job hmm. um but it's if if there's something that I want to do but I'm I feel scared yeah uh that it's not going to kill me right it's just like a something yes that's okay logically scary not actually like you know go jump off the cliff because you know it is scary and there's a good reason it's scary I think it's important also to like just to insert here to people who are like, oh, I need to go do scary things. Make sure if you do scary things, there are things that put you outside your comfort zone, but not in your terror zone, right? Where, yes. where you go yeah. into like fight, flight, all the things that is not useful. <laughs> no, is it's like useful. In, in my yoga classes, the, the teachers talk about going to your edge and like just yeah. before your edge. So don't go past your edge. Cause, exactly. Just yeah, play just to, before. Yeah. To be dangerous, but in a safe way. So what um, game did you design? What, what does it look like for yourself? So it's, it's basically if I ever had something that I would be scared to do, mm -hmm. usually it was around talking to people because I'm actually mm -hmm. an introvert, um, then I had to do it. Um, so one of the big ones was um, I used to be really scared of professional speaking, even though that's like what I do, a, a big part of my work and also yep. helping other people um in in professional speaker coaching and strategy but at the same time having to learn how to be confident doing that means that I'm really good at helping other people because if you don't have to go through yes. that like I don't understand you know yeah. um so one of the things that I did when I was doing my PhD was for some reason when you're a PhD student they you get to teach classes you get to yeah. teach undergraduates even though you have no experience other than I don't know that's just how it works so I had this opportunity to teach um, to teach one day a week at my university. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to do it um, because it's a safe space to, I think they're really forgiving because they're probably used to being taught by PhD students who are just learning how to teach. Um, so just doing that every week, um, improv classes really helped as well. And just, it was like, okay, it scared me, but it's the more that I can do it, the more that I can see that I'm not going to die yes. and that's why improv class is really great because when you're in an improv class you and everybody else there are doing a really terrible job because it's your first improv class or your yeah. second one or your third yeah. one 
So you're all like massively failing together. But once you've had that experience of, wow, I massively screwed up on stage and I still recovered and I actually can be good on my feet and I, you see yourself being different. So I think that's, I think that's what it is, is giving yourself opportunities to, to do things in a different way and be in a different way. Yes. Um, Cause I, I actually, I, this is a conference that I spoke at in, in um, the U S because when I was living in Toronto and Canada, you could just drive to a lot of American cities. So I mm -hmm. drove to this big conference and then I presented this paper that was probably the first paper on internet friendship like social wow. like friendship on social media yeah which is like a big deal yep um but I thought I answered a question wrong and not mm. well so I got in the, my car and drove back to Toronto and that was like the level of like anxiety I used to get wow. around speaking wow. so to say that this practice does work Right. Yeah, hundred percent. I yeah. I sometimes give my clients assignments, right? It's like a seven day challenge. Like every day, they have to do something that freaks them out in in a good way, right? And that is something that is actually meaningful to them because, right? It doesn't make sense to go do something you never would want to do. Yeah. You have it has to, to be something you want. Yeah, and even better if it's something fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you know, look, prof well, professional speaking is fun now. I don't think it was okay. fun at the time, but improv is fun. So, no, but yeah. the the that the idea of doing it like without all the angst that that makes sense, right? That you would do it, and then just build yeah. that confidence. That is so. And if you can make it a game too, because that's exactly. where it's. If you so that my friend challenged me to do this game, which is that I had to go into the city and speak to five people, like have huh. non like five. Yes was it non-transactional conversation so I couldn't buy a cup of coffee and then talk yeah. to the barista um it had to be just like five actual conversations with strangers and that was like terrifying to me but I did it but it was like I can't leave until I've done it and everybody wanted to talk except for one person who thought I was hitting on on their boyfriend um but it was the fact that I, even if they, even if they were awkward, all five of them were awkward. The fact that huh. I did it is like, I won the game, right? It's like, it doesn't exactly. matter what happens, I won the game. So exactly. I did it. Yes. yes. I love this. It's like a brain hack. <laughs> totally. I, I tend to give this one like something similar to clients for network events, right? Like I was like, okay, you're going to network event. I, I get that you hate it, like, et cetera, et cetera. So let's yeah. make it a game and give yourself like a secret mission, like find five people who own a cat in the room I love it. right <laughs> stuff like that make it much 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 more fun do, you, do they ever get people in on the game as well do they say hey i'm playing this i have this challenge not that, that they tell me it? but maybe they i, I wonder, don't know i'm surprised by how much people are like down to play yeah that no one really wants to be at a networking event <laughs> Right. I love this. Like just find <laughs> allies and then go work yeah. the room. And then you could actually go to like find the cat people, the dog people, and try to secretly divide them <laughs> slowly, yeah, exactly. you know, yeah. creating yeah. sections. I'm getting so many ideas already. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually a perfect like sort of um subconscious icebreaker. So like a secret yeah. mission to give people if you have like a big yeah. event and you're doing ice like surface level icebreaking, and then underneath you also give them this mission. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we didn't try that <laughs> next time. <laughs> All right. Next card is about boundaries. Oh, that's good. Again, very important around games, around facilitation, mm. but also in life itself. So yeah. what is what are boundaries for you and how do you set them and enforce them? Oh, this is a very good question. Um, well, I mean, game I mean games are all about rules and boundaries, yeah. right? Um, but I think boundaries for me are they're I think we think of them as like things that other people have to do, but they're really about our self-respect mm -hmm. because if we don't hold a boundary, how can we expect anybody else to? Exactly. Yeah. A boundary is not a boundary if you're not willing to enforce it. Yeah. You can't be like, oh, he doesn't respect my boundaries or she doesn't respect my yeah. boundaries yeah. because, well, that that's not how it works. No, right? that is wishful thinking. Like I wish people yeah. would do what I want, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. sadly, yeah. they don't. So you got to do it. You got to do it first, and then they will. Yeah. 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 And what is that like for you? Like in when it comes to, for example, I know most smart people tend to want to do a lot of things, and also yeah. most smart people get to have a lot of people ask them to do fun things with them, right? Like get invite yes. them to collaborate. So. Do you need to say no a lot? What is that like for you? How do you set boundaries around your time? 
Oh, that's a really good question too. So have you come across human design? Yes. Yeah. So I'm a projector. And so if you haven't heard of human design, you can go and um, just Google human design chart and all you need is your birthday and well, your birth time. But yeah. um, if you don't know your birth time, you can make it up. It'll still tell you generally what you are. But what I found about human design is that it's really, it's almost like astrology. on st- like, How would you describe it? I, well, to me, it is like, listen, I have a problem with it in that um, to me, it's, it's astrology multiplied beyond necessity. So I'm like, give me Occam's razor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, seriously, seriously, it's yeah. just too complicated. Not a fan. Yeah, okay. Too much, too much. But that's okay. I know it's super helpful to lots of people <laughs> like like Myers-Briggs is or whatever. It's just yeah. a way of understanding your, whether it's your character or you, your proclivities or whatever, and to make sense of how you are in the world and then multiply or amplify what you like about that. Yeah. Yeah, it's for me, it's really about energy management, which is because yeah. I, you know, astrology is interesting, Marius Briggs is interesting, enneagrams are interesting, but I find it most useful because it's like really functional. So it yeah. kind of tells you how to, it almost is like a boundary tool. So, um, you know, without getting too much into human design, um, the whole thing about projectors is you have strat, that, that's another thing I like, it's all about strategy. Mm. So you have strategies. And the strategy for projector is you have to wait for the invitation. So Um, it's all about waiting for the right. And it's not just any invitation. It's waiting for the right invitation. And so it's almost like you're waiting for an invitation. And then when that happens, you're checking in to see if it's the right one. So if someone's inviting you to do something, it has to be a good invitation Mm. and it has to sit well with you. So there's almost a a bit of checking in with yourself. Um, So learning about that has been a huge change for me because I would just say yes to everything. Right. And especially when it's big things in your life. So if I look at all of the big things that have happened to me, they've been invitations, like coming to Australia to do a PhD. So my PhD supervisor invited me. He met me at a conference and invited me. And that was changed my life. I'm still in Australia, still, you know, doing all these amazing things, thanks to doing that PhD. Um, but it's it's like, that's the thing is, it's, it's anything that's big in your life, you have to wait for that invitation. Mm. Um, but even smaller things I've noticed, um, like I don't go giving advice unless people ask me for it okay. or if I clearly, <laughs> I love clearly... That. <laughs> yeah, but it's not, and some people can do that and some people can give advice without it being asked for, I, but I mean, maybe not, but mm, <laughs> I, I have it's easier for other people. It just never, it never works for me. Like flat, you know, like blanket statement. Yeah. Um, but I think that that's the key thing of, of managing my boundaries and knowing when to say no, is it's like, am I trying to make it happen or is someone else actually like really saying, Hey, I really want you to come and do this. And are they asking for the right reason? Does it feel good in my body? Yeah, I I was going to say, it's like, you also really feel into it. Like, is this like, does this involve like a lot of like strenuous effort on my part to even get this moving? Or is it just like this moving train that I'm invited to jump on and it feels delightful and you know, yeah. Yeah. So good. The not self theme is bitterness, right? So if I try and do something and it's the wrong invitation or it's not even an invitation, and I'm like, why is no one listening to me? Why yes, is no one you listening get the to frustration. this great idea that I have? Yeah. So yeah. So totally. yeah, human design has been really great for me to figure out, um, you know, what my strategy is for what to say yes to and what to say no to and what to put my energy into. And how do you manage all the like shiny objects in your life? <laughs> in, I mean, it's a, it's a similar thing, right? Yeah. But how do I manage all the shiny objects? As in, well, you're interested yeah. in everything, I'm assuming, like almost yes. everything. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, like I all think, listeners, I'm sure. Yeah. The best way for me is, to, I think what's been the real, cha- like the game changer for me in that is really getting clear on what what my passion is, what my purpose mm-hmm. is. And it took a long time and it's only been the past few years that I've been really clear on it's about connection and curiosity and enabling that through play and because um so my my partner and I who um is my my business partner my life partner he's he's very organized and he loves spreadsheets but we put together this (laughs) hopper this hopper filter thing that has these different layers and it has to go through the hopper as well so it's kind of first it's I have that initial my personal thing of um how I, it's an invitation and do I feel invited and then if it's something we're going to work on together then it goes through the hopper so there's like these two layers yeah and that's really helped me to stay focused 
because I'm I'm neurodivergent, he's neurotypical. So mm-hmm. it's a really good partnership that we, you know, can be, I think it's like he brings order to my, I want to say creative chaos, but I think chaos has a, a negative connotation, but almost like there's just, we cover all the bases together. So yeah. I, th- yeah. I think creative chaos or just sort of all encompassing, encompassing like curiosity, yeah. right? And then that needs to be directed at some stage. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I love it. I love it. Okay. So it sounds like you, you found your kind of mission. What about values? How yeah, do they I mean, come into that? That's always been clear to me in my life mm-hmm. that it's always, I've always been very interested in um, people um understanding cultures and understanding how people connect or don't connect and understanding meaning and wanting to work with people who are changing the world like people who actually really care yeah like the go-givers that's always been very clear to me um that that's what I'm here to do is to be a go-giver or I am a go-giver I'm not here to do that I am and to support other people doing that as well so you've always known this this has always been yes, clear to you that's always been yeah, yeah. Amazing. Super clear. What yeah. what was school like for you? <laughs> Terrible. Uh-huh. I loved university, but I didn't like high school. Yeah. 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 Did you feel like you weren't challenged enough? Was it boring? I mean, well, how could well, they I have improved is, it? <laughs> well, I think this is a very typical story um, for women, neurodivergent women, um, because I, long story short, my parents have my parents ended up so yeah it's a complicated story I don't need to go into but I ended up at a school that you have to you had to do a test to get into Mm -hmm. where um I think I I don't know what it was but it was a you know some fancy IQ blah 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 and I scored off the charts and so they had Mm -hmm. these very high expectations of me but then when I got there I was a really bad student and it was like why are you being so lazy and why are you right just applied yourself right Oh my and God. So I look back and I'm like, how come no one was like, what's going on here? Right. Like what, you know, um, so how just berating you. Why didn't they yeah. try to solve the problem? Which I mean, my next card is ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So long story short, by the time I got to university, um, somehow I still got to university despite being a terrible student that didn't apply herself or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, and I, I said, okay, there's something going on here. I really have to investigate it. And this is 20 years ago. It's actually 20 years ago to the, to this year. Mm. I'm not sure what month, but it was 20, 2003. And I, so I went to the, the accessibility and diverse disability, whatever it was called at the university and said, I think I have, I think it was ADD back then. I think I mm-hmm. have this because yeah. I had some, some guy friends who, who had it. And I was like, yeah, that sounds like what, what's going on for me. And I got sent to, a, I think it was an educational psychologist. And she concluded from on more tests that I had a learning disability, which didn't sit well with me. There, she was some useful things around my learning style, which I found mm-hmm. really useful. Mm-hmm. So I got everything I needed to succeed at university through that, like accommodations and things. But I also found that saying I have learning disability to, to my professor, some of them, it actually, even though I get accommodation, you know, things like using a computer or getting more time on my exams, they would just discriminate against me. So I stopped mm-hmm. telling people about it. And yeah. when I started university, because I could do what I needed to do to learn and I didn't need to tell anybody anymore. But what happened- You basically was, hacked the system, right? You're a smart Yeah, I hacked mind. the system. But then I it was like, why is my house so messy? Why can't yeah. I be organized? Why can't yeah. I be an adult? So um, yeah, it's really it's really funny timing and, and, and you know, us connecting because- um, I decided again, I had all these amazing women friends who are getting diagnosed late, late, you know, late in their life diagnosis. Um, and, and me going, okay, I think there's something here. I think I was actually right. And I went back and um, just a few weeks ago, got a, I actually said, yeah, you're like, off lo and behold, in, inattentive <laughs> ADHD. And I'm like, yeah, this makes sense. So, yeah. yeah. So what was that like? Like getting this sort of confirmation of what you've known, obviously for years, but that people then said, no, you're wrong. Yeah, that was, well, I mean, it was, it was, yeah, lots of, lots of emotions around it. Yeah. Um, you know, just feeling like angry that I, if I'd known this 20 years ago, it would have been really helpful. And just is that, that feeling of like, wow, um, 
there's not something it's not my fault like yeah. it's not my fault and if I had been supported better or understood better than then I could have achieved you know done better in school or done whatever it was and so it's just that that ability that lack of or the energy that's freed up when you stop feeling ashamed and yes. I think thankfully I mean 20 years ago I think ADHD we, we I think we're way more accepting of me being neurodivergent now there's still so a little work to be done but yes we're getting yeah, we're getting somewhere. I can say to people like if I forget something or do something and go oh, I've just you know I, I got ADHD and people are like oh that makes sense because you're this like smart interesting creative person um so you know I can tell who's going to be open to hearing and positive yeah. So it's been, it's been, yeah, it's been complicated in the feelings, but I think just having clarity on, okay, actually this, like being validated yes. and knowing and saying, okay, now I know um, this makes sense and what, what I can do to support myself better. And so it's I, I always feel like it's really getting good- a a manual for finally yes. for your yeah. brain. Right. Yeah. And I think just for you know, to generalize it for I think I hear very similar stories from people who have been diagnosed, whether it's, you know, like late in life, whether it's with autism, whether it's ADHD, whether it's giftedness, because a lot of women, especially, but also some men don't get diagnosed until their kid gets diagnosed as being insanely smart. And they're like, oh my God, especially if they also have ADHD, most of their life, they've been told you're, you're just so stupid or so all over the place lazy or undisciplined or whatever it is all the things right and then of course there's the grief the anger and then also the the finally sort of oh my god I can stop making myself wrong right thinking I am a flawed human and like something's broken no I just have a different brain and the shit I'm amazing at and the shit I that is a bit challenging for me (laughs) good to know yeah yeah I think especially for women too because there's this whole extra layer of um things that we feel like things that I think you're supposed to do as a woman that are hard to do with ADHD um that yeah I think just knowing that is like a huge it's almost like part of your identity you can you mean like be more keeping a decent house and stuff like yeah, that or like if yeah. you're like um I don't have kids my, my partner has a daughter and I love hanging out with her but I'm like I could never there's a reason I don't have kids yeah but I've you know read about women who have kids and it's like, why can't I do everything that I need to do to yeah. be a parent? And exactly. instead of it, and but it's like they they find out later that they have ADHD. And if they've known, and I think that's why I'm like talking about it now, because it's it's I think, you know, if we women get diagnosed and women find out, then it just takes away that shame. And it's like, okay, well, this is how I am. And you can start really loving and accepting yourself. Yes. And being like, this is what I need. So I mean, that's what I love about my there's so many things I love about my partner, but he just like he's so supportive of how I am. And, and, you know, it's like the things that come, the things that come with ADHD, like there's a lot of good things too, but he's very 100%. supportive of me doing the things that I way, the way that I need to do them. And in that, it actually helps me to overcome a lot of the challenges of ADHD because I'm not spending all this time being embarrassed or ashamed. Yes. It's and such so, an energy saver, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's so important for women. I think there's just so many things in that make it extra difficult for women, especially because we don't get diagnosed until later because we're really good at masking. Yes. So I just, it's like something I really feel passionate about because it's like, you know, we're really in this time where I think the fem, we're bringing the feminine back, however we want to think about that, the yin and the value of that. And so it's like, this is really part of that, that shift in society to really value everybody, not just like half of the population. Exactly. And, and also value everybody regardless of how their brain works. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. My my next card is says building things, <laughs> and I want to talk about this at How several appropriate <laughs> several several levels, right? Like building things. Of course, you work with people who build things literally with their hands during mm-hmm. your your uh, trainings, but also you are building things for the world, right? So let's mm-hmm. go there first. What are you building? Oh, what am I building? Lots of things. Yeah. Um, actually right now I'm working on, um, I mean, this is maybe the first, <laughs> first announcement of this, but it's not a business <laughs> with my partner. Um, it's going to, okay, I'm going to hang on. I'm going to say like big, <laughs> there's a big reveal in the introduction, yeah. a big reveal during, during the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we're going to be launching probably in September and soft launching in September, but 
Um, he's a mental health accredited first aider. So he does mental health training. He's the business improvement specialist. He's kind of a Renaissance man. Um, and we're creating tools and supports. Basically, we're toying around with this, but um, support for different different leaders who make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, definitely make a difference part. We're not sure about the word different leaders um, because we, it's, we want to be kind of inclusive in the difference, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, so just find out what is the word that people use? Because I find that, you know, we we're talking about networking earlier. Um, as a, a networking event earlier in the week. And it was like all the neurodivergent and the kind of like neurodivergent curious people were all yeah. like hanging out and we're all talking <laughs> about, and you know, just, you know, the way that you talk and um, it, that was really interesting. And it's like how we find each other. Um, Cause you, you know, you and I connected without me putting anything about ADHD and it's nope. how this magic. Thing I, happened. Listen, I have become yeah. like a Sherlock Holmes for smart <laughs> neurodivergent people. I just yeah. spot you for miles away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. So how do, how do I do that? But still, um, cause I think that when I say different, it's, it's not just neurodivergence. It's also people who might be doing leadership differently. Yeah. So, um, I actually posted on LinkedIn saying, do you identify as a, a different leader? And, um, there's a comment saying things around, yeah, I do leadership differently. I bring playfulness into it. So that's why I'm different. So it's really, um, yeah, finding how do we be inclusive and different. So we'll see, we'll see how that language goes, but it's definitely that's. that's and what are you doing. building for them? So things like um, Lego serious play certification, but looking at one of the big things that has been. Um, um, so Matt, my partner, he, when he comes in to do on the third day of my, I do a three day certification for Lego serious play with a the super connect add on, which is where we bring in all of the kind of um let's say expansion packs yep um so he comes and teach, teaches psychological safety so what we're getting is that there's a lot of people who are interested in mental health first aid but for facilitators because it's a very mm -hmm. it's an amazing course you can take um that basically teaches you how to deal with uh, a mental health crisis so similar to if you're you know hit by a car or have an accident um it's how to deal with a, a, a mental health crisis rather than a physical one which we don't really get trained in as much but it's becoming more of a thing i wish oh my god i can't believe this is becoming a thing that's amazing yeah Seriously, if so everyone would get like their mental health first aid diploma like i had to do suicide prevention for a coach training of course but that was pretty much it but i mean if all the humans would be able to like wow. yeah 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 and it's like talking openly about mental health to so getting rid of the stigma i mean that's a big part of it is just being able to ask people what's going on yeah um and so that's just a general, like, you know, like physical first aid is a general thing. But um, the reason I started, um, the reason I did my my training initially was because it was like, well, the safe space that gets created and the vulnerability that gets created when we're doing super connect and Lego serious play, I need to really respect that and hold that space properly. Yeah. Um, thankfully, I've never had anything happen that's been a crisis, um, but I feel confident enough to know what to do yeah. and a lot of the lego series play practitioners that i talk to because that's not part of the standard lsp lego series play um curriculum they're like I, you know what do i do if someone cries what do i do if oh. this happens right <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah and so it's like creating this thing that for, for facilitators to learn how to create psychological safety but also yeah. practical things like you know if you're working with a team who's is there a mental health first aider at at the organization or is there an HR person that you should connect them with? So just knowing all of these things. Um, so that's one of them is, is building that into um, as a, as an offering mental health first aid training is another thing. So just things like that, basically almost like around human connection. So what you need is someone making a difference around human connections. So those kinds so wh of things. Why those do you initial. think, why do you think leaders need this? Why is it important? Why is it important to create psychological safety? Why is it important for a leader? Yeah. I mean, I yeah. I know, and we probably agree on this, but I <laughs> yeah. mean, you may need to sell it to some people. Why? Why? Well, I mean, leaders are busy. They have to do all the yeah. things and keep things running. And now they also need to do psychological safety. I mean, for, I mean, from a purely business perspective, I think yeah. it's if, if the, the outcomes you get when people feel safe and like, but not like a fake, like you have to, you can't feel fake safe. You can't fake it, right? No. So no, like a token gesture. Oh, there's a person you can talk to if you're upset. Yeah, you right? can't do but... you can't do tokenism. It doesn't yeah. work. 
Um, but if you are getting people to feel genuinely safe because everybody's consenting, everybody's, you know, part of it, um, the, the outcomes you can get in terms of, you know, insight into a problem or um, clarity around a solution to the problem or just getting people on the same page. Like I've done workshops where an or organization will come in. So this isn't the training, but this is if you book me to come and run a session for you. Mm -hmm come in saying, we're really stuck on this thing and we've worked with these people and we've worked with these people and we don't know what to do about this problem. And then in the session, we actually find out that it's not, this isn't the problem, it's something else. Something and, underneath, right? And yeah. they haven't, no one's felt okay to, to really go there. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, that's the thing. Oh, and now that we know that, we're actually really, we're already actually aligned about that. And so if we do this instead, and it's like this huge break through, breakthrough through this this thing that feels like it's been a problem and been stuck for mm. for a year. And, yeah. that's and they the just couldn't get to it because of the lack of safety, basically. Yeah. yeah. So that's from a purely business perspective, but I think you know, doing the right thing. Yeah. Um, totally. You know, if you want to be like, good, like moral, yeah. morally, ethically. Yeah. Yeah, totally. and also you know, we, we, there's a lot of talk about the great resignation, you know, yes. lots, lots of turnover. Like if you keep your employees happy and keep the people on your team happy and safe and it's just, there's just so many reasons that it's, yeah. it's good. Yeah. I totally agree. And also just mental health, like well being. if someone feels yeah. safe at work and I, sadly, I think so few people do. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So there's a lot of work to be done there as well, there which brings me to my next card, innovation. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah. I was looking at what you've done, like, or at least a couple of the things you've done in your life. I think this is pretty much a red thread, huh? Like innovation for you constantly yeah. thinking what, okay, I have this now, I have this certification or I have this tool now, what, how can I change it? So tell me a bit more yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, innovation is one of those words that's kind of become a buzzword, right? <laughs> right. It's like, like authenticity. That, yeah. It's like, <laughs> it means everything and nothing. Right. So what does it mean um, to you? Well, I think it's, so I do, I write an innovation and tech column for the business news here in Western Australia. So I have to think, you know, what, what passes the, the, the innovation test, but mm -hmm. it's almost like, what can I sneak in to, huh. um, to be <laughs> innovative, right? Cause not just about tech. So it's it's really if you're doing solving a problem in a new way. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't think about this being innovation, but here in Australia, um, we've just legalized MDMA and psilocybin for the treatment right. of um, um, treatment resistant mm -hmm. um, depression and um, PTSD. Mm -hmm. I think Amazing. we're the first country in the world to do that. And I've written a few articles in my innovation column about that because that's a really innovative way to solve this problem with mental health that we haven't. We haven't, it hasn't evolved. It hasn't innovated in what, 30, 40 years. Yeah. Um, so it's things like that. What's actually really moving the needle in a new way. And um, I mean, it is kind of old because there was a lot of research in the 70s, 60s and 70s. But, yeah. But then of course it was bad. Well, a bunch and... of political reasons. Yeah. Yes. Um, but still, so it's things like that. What is a, a new way of solving this really sticky problem? So that's, that's what innovation is to me. Yeah. And how do you do that? How do you innovate? What does that look like? How do I innovate yeah. <laughs> by being professionally curious? Yeah, <laughs> it's like I can't help it. Um, yeah, so I just like yeah. almost you just live and you breathe and you innovate. Yeah, I think yeah. asking really good questions is a really mm -hmm. good. I and mean, that's the other secret to super connect is um, is asking really good questions because it is about the Lego, but it's also not about the Lego. It's about the questions. And Give me an example of that. What what. What does that a look really like? good question? Yeah. So I did, and that this is the thing is that really good question. In the, in the context of like Lego Serious Play and Super Connect, really simple questions can be really powerful. So I did a session that was at a conference for a very large group of people. I think it was about 800 people. Wow. And it was exploring diversity. And the questions were something like build what it feels like to be included or create what it feels mm -hmm. like to be included and create what it feels like not to be included. But what came out of that was I found out that two people came out as gay mm -hmm. um, to their leadership during that. Wow. From, just from those questions. And so it's, it doesn't have to be, it just was a well thought out question and it was designed to really explore that. It wasn't specifically meant to make anything happen other than to have people discuss and talk about openly about diversity and what yeah. we can do to support it. Um, 
but it was, you know, working with the organizers of the conference to go, okay, what's the outcome that we want people to have and designing it from there. Um, but I think it's just, it's, yeah, it's being really thoughtful about why am I asking the question? What's the outcome that I want and what's the best way to ask it? And what's the order that you want to ask the question in? Yes, and, for sure. Yeah. And I think yeah. you said it's a simple question. I think most powerful questions are very simple. Yeah. That's Deceptively true, so. Deceptively yeah. so. I think, I mean, you know, I have a background in philosophy. Um, if anybody else, like, what is the use of philosophy? It is, you get to learn how to ask great questions. And usually yeah. they are really simple. <laughs> Someone's like, huh. Yeah. <laughs> Let me think and about that's, that. It's funny because I also, my undergraduate degree is in philosophy. And it's one of those things where it's, I think, you know, it's served us both very well, even though it seems like a very old thing to study. Yes. It's, it's, it's you know, it's uh, innovate, not innovation. It's, um, you know, if I'd gone to study digital media or new media, it was called at the time when I was going to university, everything I would have learned is, would be obsolete, but philosophy yes. and you know, how to ask a good question. It's, it's that's always just, relevant. It's yeah. always pertinent. Yep. Yeah. Um, although I have to say, I wouldn't recommend it as a first degree now, I think. I mean, I, I think for me, it was like, you know, pretty intense and also so theoretical, like, but then I've yeah. made my life applied philosophy, basically. So yeah. that's all right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Which brings me to my next card, freedom. Oh, wow. Is, is that an important value for you? Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> how can I even ask the question? Like all smart people, all smart creative people. So how do you create it? Well, I think, you know, going back to that, the neurodivergence and ADHD that for me to have freedom was to be able to do things the way I needed to do it without mm -hmm. having to ask or to justify myself or, you know, to fight for it. And that was making my own business and my own company yeah. to be able to have the freedom to do things the way that worked for me. Um, so, yeah, I would say that that's. Okay, I, I'm just going to get the next <laughs> part as well. And we can cover yeah. them together, money. which is oh, money. You're asking all the good questions. <laughs> And for a lot of people, they think they can't be free because money, right? So how do you do that? How do you manage? Well, I think the secret for that is going back to what we were talking about before about finding your thing. Yeah. The thing that is really your thing. Um, because when I, so I do, I do, I also help Lego series play practitioners with the business side. So I do business mm -hmm. strategy for LSP people because, you know, Lego is easy, right? Yeah. Like. That's easy and you can use it for anything, um, but it's finding what is your particular niche. So actually one of my my students um, who did my Lego series play certification is now using, she's combined her philosophy education training. Another philosopher, philoso yay. Philoso brick. So oh my up, God. Brick. She so works with double, double, twice exceptional kids. So I think gifted and um, learning disability. Yep um or neurodivergent um but her that that's the that's her unique thing and she was told and she shared with this with me that you know all these people have said to her you know this isn't a good idea you shouldn't do this business and no, no, no. and she's her business is going gangbusters i love it um, I love yeah it. her name is amanda rogers and she's yeah look it up philosopher brick but it's there's something really magic and I've noticed this with the people that I, that I coach is that when you find this thing, you just know in all of your being that this is your thing. Yes. And if that's, you have that knowingness and I think that's where we look at, you know, any really successful entrepreneur, they talk about how like failure never came into their mind. And I always wondered how is it that you could just be so bold and fearless. And once I experienced going, Oh, this is actually my thing. I was able to go, I get how they are able to have that fearlessness. It's like, once you've tapped into that, I think that's a really kind of like secret thing, secret sauce thing that we're not told about entrepreneurship. Yes. It's like you never, you never give up and just have tenacity, but no, it's actually, you have to be attuned into what that thing is that is your thing and really going with that. Yeah. And then and, it's like, and then it's like you, magic. you can't not do it. Yeah. Right. It's, it's sort of non-negotiable. Yeah. Like for me, I can't, I mean, it's just not even a question yeah. of, you know, of doing something else. It's like, no, this is the thing. I do want to add to that, that it can change during your life, right? This, because yeah. some people get sort of hung up on like, I have to find the one thing. This isn't it. Like, or I, if I found a thing, 
I have to stick with it. No, it evolves, right? And you evolve. For sure. Like my my thing was teaching art for a very long time and photography. And that was perfect for seven yeah. years. And then it morphed into something else. So people, you yeah. get to grow still even really after you found point. the thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> there can be many things. And maybe the one that the things are actually one thing. Yes. Because like you, I did, you know, did philosophy, did a PhD, I worked as a journalist, did a teacher, all these different things. And I still do all of those things. But yeah. the one thing that brings them all together is that it's all about connection and curiosity. Yes. And so, yeah, don't, you don't have to get stuck. Exactly. So it's all, also thing. about finding a theme or yeah. the red thread or whatever yeah. it is. And yeah. I love that you're saying this because I have to like um, remind coaching clients of this quite regularly who are like, but I wasted this education because I'm doing something completely different, etc. I'm like, no, 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 no. You have this There's amazing. Never waste. No. Yeah. And you, you have this amazing toolkit. You have these skills. You have this knowledge. Like my Aikido, which I never thought I would use like outside the Aikido dojo has been like the most incredible tool for coaching, for feeling energies, for working with groups of people and knowing what they need in the moment, right? For being a speaker on the stage and being completely grounded, like it's been invaluable. I had no idea. I just was yeah. super frustrated and wanted to like let, let that energy rip. <laughs> that is how yeah. I found that keto. <laughs> but it just plays into everything I do now. So whatever you feel pulls toward, I guess it's, it's a good sign that you are approaching. Yeah, yeah. I would agree. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of like anger and frustration, power. <laughs> Let's talk about power because okay. that's kind of a taboo um, topic and we can approach it from lots of different angles. Like as a facilitator, we have power, mm. right? But also I think especially women, but I think also a lot of more introverted men and very, like very many smart people shy away from power. Like I don't want power. Right? That is like for bad people. Um, so I love to chat about that. What are your thoughts? <laughs> oh, that's again, I'm thinking about the Barbie movie that I went to see yesterday uh -huh. um, because it's it is really about. It is about power. That's the mm -hmm. whole movie, really. Mm -hmm. um, and the way I mean, I, I don't want to spoil this too much if you haven't yeah, seen no it. Yeah, no spoilers. But... I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> but, you know, one of the ways that let's say that they they cause transformation in the movie is through talking about the paradox of being a, a woman mm -hmm. and all these like contradictory expectations a lot of them are really about power yeah and yeah i mean i'm not sure what more to say about power <laughs> do you actually are you aware of the power you hold for example and are you comfortable being powerful and does what does powerful even mean to you I haven't actually thought about that. This mm -hmm. is a good question. Okay. While you're thinking, I'll I'll <laughs> say a little bit about what it is like for me, because power is also influence, right? And the ability mm. to make an impact to me. So if mm. I have power, it doesn't, I think we associate power too much with the ability to control other people. Yeah. Right. And that's where our brain goes straight away instead of, wow, if I have power, if I'm powerful, I can make a massive difference in the world. And mm. I get to choose what that power looks like. Mm. And it doesn't need to mean I get to control other people, but it can mean that I have the capacity to reach a lot of people, but also maybe to like have a, a very tangible impact, maybe even on my local community, because people listen to me because either I have a shit ton of money or I know the right people. Mm -hmm. And I think you you can totally ignore this and, and say, I don't play those games. But if people like, I always say like, we need more good people with both money and power mm. <laughs> and willing to play maybe change the rules even um if we want to change the world so that's that's my two cents. yeah i'd have to i would have to agree with you because if you think about the go-giver mentality versus the go-getter mentality that's about power as well and what kind yes. of power do you want so do you want do you want money and power as in control or do you want to be able to help people and the power mm -hmm. to help and to change the world yeah. and and make a living doing it because i don't think we need to have the scarcity mentality of like oh, i'm trying to exactly. make the world better so i'm not going to get paid yeah and that's like a yeah. lack of you can know, we you please stop that right now because yeah, you Seriously. don't you don't need to do that right because you're not yeah. you're not it's lack of, of self respect or self-worth and you know i'm saying that as someone who's like had to really work through that 
Yeah, it's a very um, false road also to burnout yeah, and resentment. Ab- abundant, abundance mentality. Like, let's have abundance mentality rather than yeah. scarcity. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, I think there is that 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 power to make a difference. Um, I think that's also what is part of the feeling of what I'm meant to be, like, this is what I'm meant to be doing. Because it's, again, it's like, after I've done, you know, like a serious play training, or I've done a coaching session, or I've done you know, that workshop with, with all those people where that huge shift happened for, for yeah. a team. Um, it's this feeling of almost like there's this power that isn't me. Like, it's yes. like I was just there. How, it works helping through it. you. Like, yeah. So it's not, it's not about me or my ego or my, me having control. It's about me enabling this thing. Yeah. And there is a power in that. And when I feel really aligned with what I'm meant to be doing, that's when I feel, wow, like I, I look and I see what's happened for people. Yeah. Um, because even, in, you know, doing the certification, the three-day certification where you're learning about Lego and learning it, how to use it in your business or your workplace or whatever it is you're doing with it, people also have this profound transformation in themselves. And it's interesting how whoever comes, they're, they're in a point seems to be where they're like, I'm making this transition where I'm either making this decision to, to, you know, partner with myself better or to leave this job and start my own company or launch this new thing. And it's like this huge personal growth thing that happens. And I would say facilitation, like the truest form of facilitation is you're not coming in with an agenda. You're coming in just to hold yes. space to enable what is happening in the room rather than I'm going to come in and I have this plan. Like you have to have something in your back pocket. Of course you have a plan, right? Yeah. But not like but, for what people should experience and, and what yeah. their growth should look like. It's the same yeah. with coaching. If you're like, oh, you should change this way, then that's not a great it's way to not, coach people. And it's not empowering people. No. And it's funny, similar to you with Aikido, um, I have been studying um, training in an energy healing modality called Kibir Energetics. And it's basically a mix of biocranial sacral massage and shamanism. And the reason I love it is that it's taken a lot of the healing modalities um, because most of the things in the world we've lost the feminine, it's just the the yang. And so um, Kat Kibir, who, who's created this method, she's taken them and made them, brought the feminine back. And so her approach that she teaches is instead of going, I'm going to come and fix you. Yeah. I know what's best for you. It's I'm going to hold space. I'm going to be as present and grounded and almost like um, set, set the show but by example, what you can be. Yeah. And, and, and you can like co-explore instead of like lead right or pull. yeah yeah so I'm just holding space so the reason I started studying it was like this is really a great tool for being a better facilitator right yeah because it's all these things you can do and people will say you know I, I feel like there's something more going on that's not just about the lego so people mm-hmm. can feel it um but it's it's that same thing of like I'm not actually doing anything like she talks about it being the you know the the, the art of doing nothing yeah. um but there's a huge power in that and it's maybe it's like the yin power rather than the yang power is just the power is creating the space for people to to do what they need to do rather than you putting it on them. For me, it isn't like it doesn't break down into like a male or female, but it's just I feel like I become a channel for something that is so much bigger mm-hmm. than me. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of disappear and mm-hmm. whatever needs to come through comes through, which is yeah. so fun. And, and so yeah. and there's so much ease. And when you work that way. In, when I started teaching workshops, I was exhausted afterwards, right? But once yeah. you sort of build that trust and you can just let things happen, it's so much. So it, it, it can actually be incredibly energizing. Yeah, you feel energized at the end. That's a huge thing yes. to know that you're doing the right <laughs> exactly. thing, right? How do you feel after? <laughs> That's a great test. Okay, but we have to talk about something that I've been dying to talk about, <laughs> which is, I mean, can you guess? Like Lego, of course. Like, <laughs> why Lego? How how did you start? I think people listening to the podcast, if they don't know by now that I'm obsessed with Lego, what have you been doing? <laughs> <laughs> why, why Lego? Lego? Well, Lego was my favorite toy as a kid. Mm-hmm. And my favorite, it was, it was uh, the medieval one, the castle Lego. Oh my God. Have you Lego. seen the new iterations? Yes. <laughs> I have all of them. <laughs> 
<laughs> you have all I of have them. All, or... Yeah, I have all of them and we're slowly working through building them. So we're working on the, the, the space. That was my third favorite one, the space one. Yep. So yeah, the 90th anniversary, 90th anniversary where they brought back all the like classic stuff. Yes. From the 90s, from the 80s and 90s. Um, so I loved that as a kid. And it was kind of like the only thing my parents really let me you know, we're okay with me doing as a kid because I also loved video games and the internet. And those are things they wish I would stop doing. But Lego was okay because it wasn't on this on the screen. Yeah. Um so I, you know, as I got older, I kind of stopped playing with Lego. But um I found out, I don't know how I found out, but maybe it's through some of my facilitator friends that there was this thing called Lego Serious Play. And I was like, so you can use Lego for business purposes. Um, <laughs> so, um, Instagram magically, uh, showed me, it was like the algorithms. Usually they, they don't show me useful things. No, the same algorithms <laughs> think all sorts of strange things about me, um, based on the ads that I get, but it was right. And it showed me someone in, in Perth, um, who had just done his Lego series play training. And I was like, okay, I need to ask this guy what it's all about. And he gave yeah. me a demo. And he trained with Michael Fern as well. And so he connected me with Michael Fern, um, who does training in Australia. He's amazing. His whole thing is um, being very much around finding your method in the method. So yes. uh, there's you know, there's different styles Love you, it. Can, you can train with. There's more like, this is how it is. And you don't deviate from it, which is obviously not my style. Yeah. But my, my real interest in it was... You know, I was using games and playfulness and game design as tools for all of the outcomes I talked about around, you know, clarity and connection and curiosity and trust. Um, but it was really hard work mm -hmm. to create a new yeah. game every time. And also yeah. there was a lot of misunderstanding and there's still a lot of, you know, it's like, oh, games, my my son does that. And I wish he would stop. Yeah, that's that so cute. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just it was like the wrong, people just didn't understand. There was just so much education that needed to be done it was exhausting so it was like what if I could use Lego to do what I want to do and the, the the transformations and the the coaching and the, all of the things what if I can use Lego instead and that's what happened I love it. so it's just yeah it's magic yeah and how I mean so you signed up for the certification did you immediately feel like you were at home or was there a bit of sort of oh this is this will take some adjustment what, what was that no it was amazing like? it was great <laughs> yeah but it was really weird because for some reason so I had to go to Melbourne to do it yeah and I couldn't sleep like I'd wake up every every hour um Why? and so I was well I think it was I think I'm sensitive to EMF and it was like I was right in the CBD and there's just you know all these people and wi-fi and all these things and that's the only thing I can think it was but I literally was sleeping and waking up every hour oh my gosh so it was like sleep deprived I was drinking tons of coffee which I don't usually do but it was still amazing so maybe yeah. it was just like you know the excited the, all these things the excited energy right yeah. yeah yeah so it was it despite that or you know because of it or all of those things it would just felt like wow this is my mind is being blown um and then it was it was actually when I started to really figure out my my method and the method and my interest in connection and I was using it as a, a um it's another funny thing about me is I'm a trained uh, dating and relationship coach which goes to the oh, connection stuff my God. <laughs> it's a very particular so application of that <laughs> but I was using it I had a dating product that it was a, a tool for dating um which I've kind of you know unlaunched it and it will probably come back in another form but it, it did but the I mean hang on from that Lego <laughs> for dating like that is gold <laughs> yeah well now that I've retired it people are like can you use this for dating and I'm like yep so now yep. I actually am coaching people and using it as a tool for dating so it's Amazing. it's funny yeah but it's just you know how how do you um yeah how, finding my own method in that um and it was right before COVID so it was very interesting timing for all of this in terms of human connection or not yeah. yeah yeah and also how do you also teach it online or just in person uh, I am about to launch an online um super connect only so mm -hmm. the difference really between super connect and lego serious play is that yes it's really focused on better conversations and human connections yeah but it's if you are a lego serious play facilitator you'll know you'll know that there's different techniques so the build a tower with you in it with some, that says something about you is called an individual build or individual mm -hmm. creation. So it's just that you build it individually. Yeah. 
Um, and then you can go on and do a whole bunch of other things where you take individual builds and create them together and do a shared one um, and do all sorts of fancy things with that, which can take, you know, like a whole day and you, yeah. it's amazing what you can do. Um, but with Super Connect, there, it's main, it's just entirely those individual builds and it's really about creating connection. And so there's people who don't need to learn the rest of like the Lego series play method. Right. They just want to use it as a tool for mentoring or a tool for speed dating. I had a, a dating coach come to one of my trainings. So um, it's something that could could be, be, be taught online. I've had a lot mm-hmm. of people wanting to, to do that. So that's the next thing is Super Connect will be an online course that if you just want to learn a bit of like a serious play or you just want to have a new way to connect or that's the thing that's going to be uh, available and will you, hopefully will people, this year. Do they then have to buy their own Lego or what does that look like? I'm super curious. Oh, that's, that's a very good question because it's, <laughs> it's a challenge because, because it's open source, yeah. Lego um, hasn't updated their official Lego serious play kit since 2010. Wow. So because we're all innovating, we, um, we buy those kits, but we adapt them. Mm. So I buy those kits and then I will add other things into them. Yeah. Like Lego friends are really great for making um, your Lego sets yes. a lot more diverse and inclusive. Yeah. So I, I, um, you can buy Lego and you can do it yourself. So if I'm training you online, you could just get it. Um, but people who work with me in Australia, I'll, I provide custom kits. So I have a right. kit called a spark kit, which is for two people. It comes with a set of cards um and so that's just yeah so it's the cards that I would say are really the thing that people want and yeah. you can use it with any Lego but it comes with a special um special little kit of Lego that's designed for two two or three people mm. um so yeah it is it is an interesting space because of um Lego stock is constantly changing so yeah um yeah yeah <laughs> and you which keeps it interesting as well I guess because you constantly have to improvise with yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's easy for me when I'm running workshops because I can just, I know how to make a kit that, or, you yeah. know, how, for how, the number of people or the outcome, but it's being able to standardize something and say, always be able to provide the same thing. That's the challenge. Yeah. So that's something I, I think is an ongoing problem for the LSP community is. Yeah, really, to solve. Yeah. Yeah. And half the time the stuff is sold out. <laughs> so for during COVID, <laughs> it was sold out for like two or three years. You couldn't get any of the the basic lego series play kit so amazing yeah wow wow okay this is a i i have i'm this is such a dangerous conversation for me because i'm already <laughs> having so many ideas <laughs> of things i want to create and problems i want, want to solve and of course another certification to add to the already very long list right do you have a, a routine like a, a, or rituals what sort what does your day look like are there specific things you do to be more productive or to stay focused i have just started uh this new journal that's for mm-hmm. it's the fast brain adhd journal um and i'm really actually really loving it because it's designed so that you have a week plan every week so i've set on my calendar every monday uh at nine o'clock i have to go to a ca- i don't have to i get to go to a cafe and plan my week and okay, hang on. About it. Go to yeah. a cafe. Why? <laughs> um, because it's almost like a treat. Yeah. For me to go to a cafe, and it's like the disruption of the the habit. Mm-hmm. So it's like I go there, and it's like somehow I'm in a a, a different space. Um, I love it. Being at home. Yes. Yeah, so There's just, so much I science find... around this, right? Like that. It's sometimes you need to just move to a different space. Yeah. Like I have five tables for different activities, and I just move to ah, a different I table. Love that. Yeah, it's a bit like it's 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 very luxurious. It also it's yeah. also very expensive, but I'm happy to pay that amount of money um to just reset my mind. But also going to a cafe can be a great way to reset your state and also of course yeah. kill distractions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you go to a cafe, you plan your week. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I've been ch- experimenting with going to a different cafe every week. Uh-huh. I don't know how sustainable that will be, but it's you know it's like that little funness of okay, yeah adventure yeah um and then the journal is really great because each week or each day is slightly different so the to-do mm-hmm. list is slightly different like similar enough that it's going to keep you on a routine but different enough that you're not going to get bored this and is the genius. best part <laughs> the best part about it is that the books come in month a month book 
So you don't have a 12 month thing. And the idea behind that is that if you stop doing it, then you get the whole, well, I didn't do it anymore. So I'm going to give up. You just go, I'm just going to start a new book. And there's 12 different colors and the book is all really tactile and just like it's designed to be really, yeah. So um, this is like, I'm three weeks in, two weeks in now, three weeks in. Yeah. Um, And I'm just finding, I'm really, really loving that. So it's like how to, that's the challenge I've always had is I need a routine, but I hate routine. Yes. So this is a way to go, okay, well, I'm going to every Monday at nine o'clock, or maybe it's a bit later if I, you know, if I have something I can't get out of or can't move. So sometimes it's 11, depending, Um, but it's always Monday and it's always going to be at a cafe, maybe different. So it's like, how can you have a different routine, but it's a different routine, which is how the journal is designed. I love it. So I think, yeah. This is a great example of like how to work with your mind, right? Rather than against it, because so many people with ADHD try to do it like the boring, predictable way and try to like schedule everything in their calendar and then never stick to it, hate themselves more. Um, by those journals, I think if I if we were in a room with all the listeners and I said, okay, can the people who have started a journal um, and then sort of given up on it like more than 10 times raise their hands, I think almost everyone in the room would be like, yep, that's yeah. me. Yeah, like, yeah. I have a journal of them. Miles <laughs> of them. So I love the idea yeah. of monthly. So good. Yeah. And then what do you do to like keep yourself focused? So I would say um, meditation and rock Mm -hmm. climbing and yoga are like the three things. And so I have to do some kind of movement every day. I'm not going to say have to. I get to do. Well, I Um, I always say like I'm like a dog that needs to be walked. So I mean, yes, yes, I get to, but it's very important for my mental health and also for the way I am around other people. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Excuse me, how productive I am. Yeah. 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 And I, I love rock climbing because, so I do bol- uh, bouldering, which is a type of rock climbing that you don't have ropes. Mm-hmm. And there's something about that, which is, you know, if you fall, if you, you know, if you don't, when, when you're climbing with ropes, you can just stop and the rope will hold you. Yeah. But with, with bouldering, if you stop, you fall or you, you have to hold yourself there. So yeah. You start shaking just, and it will get very uncomfortable. Yeah. But it's also fun and it's a bit more, it feels more dangerous, even though it's, I don't think it actually is because you have these big mats at the bottom. Um, but the research is finding that rock climbing and bouldering are actually it better if as good as, if not better than um, anxiety and depression medication. I'm sure um, they are. Oh my it's God. It's not just the exercise, but it's yeah. the, if you're not present in your body, if you're ruminating, if you're doing all of the things you can't be climbing. And so it's, you're going to fall, you're going to, you know, mess up and it's just not going to be satisfying, but there's just not only, you know, being able to be present and be on the wall if you want to climb, but there's something around, um, there's such a supportive community of people who you go and they'll, they'll help you to figure Mm -hmm. out how to to climb and in a really good way, like a really positive way, a non-competitive way, there's people who are like Olympic level athletes that come at my gym that will give you tips. And it's just really That's, this beautiful camaraderie. Yeah. But also it's like, you can go in and you can be working on, they're called problems, working on a climb um, where you come in maybe three times and each time you get a little bit better, a little bit better and you get a little bit further and it's like, Oh, can you just move your hand this way or move your foot this way? And someone might give you a little tip. It just unlocks. And it's like, it's a big puzzle you get as to well. The top. Yeah, it's like video games for your body. But no matter how bad your day is, if you can go and have a little, you know, I actually reached the top or I got a little bit further. Like yeah, I hacked this, this part of the of the, yeah. Of the bouldering. Yeah. 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 So it's just it's like no matter how bad my day is, I can go bouldering and I'll feel better. I love this. I I think it has so many components that I then recognize from my Aikido, like for example, weapons training. That <laughs> that's so cool. Right. But again, you, you, I mean, I still miss it because you feel so alive, yeah. right? You feel, yeah, you feel if alive. You're, yeah. If you're not present, you, yeah. you, you're you going to get, get hurt. hurt. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Real bad. And even it's, yeah. it's wooden people thinking like, what, what is, am I now in a slasher movie? No, no, no. I train with wooden, wooden weapons, but still it hurts like hell if they hit you with them. Um, so it's a sense of aliveness, but also, what I love that you're you're um, saying about this, and it's I, I think it's the same when you're learning a musical instrument, for example, 
there is so many layers, right? You start to resolve yeah. a puzzle at a certain level. You're like, oh, if I just tilt my hands slightly like this, oh my God, this makes a massive difference to my cut with the yeah. sword, right? And then if I change my stance this this way, and then you get to that level. And then next, maybe there'll be something internal that clicks yeah. or that like, you know, in your thinking, like, how do I even approach this cut? And then you get to another level and there's so many layers, it never gets boring. Yeah. And that is yeah, and it's, it's such a mindset thing too. Like I, um, I hadn't been climbing for a few weeks um, for a variety of reasons, and um, so my first climb back, it was like, oh, I'm feeling not strong, and I'm feeling whatever. And then I was like, no, I'm I'm just gonna do it. I'm gonna be ama- I'm amazing. I'm strong. I'm healthy. I'm all these you know, just changing the mindset. Yep. And it was. I because I, I, I do that because I know that it makes a difference. I yes. can actually see myself go from I can't reach it to I can. And there's just so much that's mental and it's just such a practice of the mental mindset. I love um, it. That's redundant, but <laughs> the mindset um that you just reminds you of it because you actually see physically. So it's that really great feedback. Yeah. Because I don't think you always get that feedback like directly about your mindset, but just to go, you know what, you've been not climbing, be easier on yourself, but also like believe that you can and it makes such a huge difference. So I think all smart humans should have something like this. I don't care what it is, right? <laughs> Whether it's no, but it could be pottery. It's a similar thing, right? You have to do something with your body and you have to learn a skill, but you also get super challenged, frustrated, all the things, and you have to be very present to it, whether it's rock climbing, martial arts, but it, it's amazing for your mindset, your confidence, your mental health, yeah. like all the things it is priceless and you can do it for the rest of your life yeah i agree (laughs) (laughs) so good i'm just looking at the time oh oh my god like i have so many cards left and now i have to like decide (laughs) um forever i know we could do this for like five hours okay (laughs) chat chat gpt oh yeah (laughs) is it the end of the world a fun toy i mean like how how do you see it (laughs) Um, probably all of those things. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm really fascinated by AI and, uh, so I did, I did a keynote recently, um, at a conference for market, the marketing association association here in Western Australia, who are very concerned, um, about what's the, what's the future with, with generative AI. They should be as marketeers. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I think the, uh, the big thing, um, in that is really talking about, like what is generative AI versus transformative AI mm. and what are the really human things that we still can't replace with, yeah. with AI and what are the good things that it can do? So there's a lot in that. Um, so where to start? Um, I think the first one is, is a lot of the headlines that we see around AI is going to do these, these things. It's going to destroy humanity. Yeah. Those are very valid concerns, but not to confuse them with generative AI, which is where we are now. So generative generative AI is kind of like um, almost like the best, the average of the best. It's just copying. Yeah, it's just copying what humans have already created. It's not actually creating anything new. It's not really in. It's not actually innovating. Um, and there's a lot that we can do with that, but that's not what the the AI experts are concerned about that's that's not the singularity quite yet no that's not the singularity (laughs) um and that that's where people are concerned and i think there is we you know who knows if we can actually ever create a consciousness that's smarter than humans it's possible but we don't know um and also what what does smarter than mean i mean we yeah you know there's there's so many questions yeah um but what I, I would think is really, so yeah, there's a, a lot of concerns around that and how do we teach it and what does it learn? And, and all, and you know, if we teach it, like we're already I'm seeing, there's a video I shared on LinkedIn about how, if you put in on into mid journey, like show a CEO, it shows a, a white, yeah, guy. A white man. Yeah. Yep. And so yep. there's, and because it's the best, you know, it's the, the average of the best. And I wouldn't the say it's the average of the best. It's the average of, <laughs> of the, the dominant, the, <laughs> the no- dominant yeah. paradigm in tech. In that case, it's not the best, right? Yeah. It's the, <laughs> what's the? How are we? It's the it's just a prejudice. The prejudice yeah, of the stereotype. people who built it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and the prejudice stereotype. of the people dominating the interwebs. Yeah. And yeah. so, if, if all of the images we show, like if you look at movies, are of you know, unfortunately, movies, for example, most of the CEOs will be white guys, right? So. 
that if that's what we're creating as humans and that's what we're using to train AI, then that's what's going to come out of it. Yes. Um, and so if that is how we train whatever becomes, if it does become sentient, then we do have a problem. Um, and so I think the the big part of that is to remind us that, you know, there's a flip side to that is that it is what we train it. It is what AI is, is people. And that means we still have control. That means we can still influence what happens and still change what happens. And so it's just remembering that we are creating this or not creating. We're making yeah. those decisions. But I'm actually publishing a- an interview next week at the time of recording with someone who is creating like a think tank for people who want to work on like the input to AI and making it more inclusive. So lots of people mm. are fighting to make that you know better but what i am super curious about because i think um like chat gbt can also be an amazing tool for play and fun and experimentation yes yeah so how do you good side of it right how do you play with it well i I just find it's a great tool for you know being able to you know get a draft started for something Mm -hmm. so it's like having um a creative partner to be able to jam with and get ideas from and refine ideas and get feedback on things. So again, it is going to be, have a certain set of biases and and data that it's trained on. Um, But it can still be a way to, you know, ask questions and just continually ask questions and see what the answer is and refine your questions based on the answer. And it's almost like a way of seeing what the hive mind thinks. Yes. Um, You know, what does the hive mind think is the best way to say this? Or maybe it's not the best way, but it's, or it's what the hive mind thinks is the best or is the right way. And maybe it isn't, but that provides an alternate opinion to maybe what you have. Exactly. Right. At least you're not thinking completely in an isolated bubble um, anymore as you were. And by the way, I have, yeah, exactly. I used it last week to come up with some exercises for workshop. And one of them was, I was like, this is insane. I'm going to use this. This is a brilliant idea. And I never would have thought of it. So it was also oh, kind of wow. humbling. Yeah. So it is a very, it can be very creative if you use the right prompts. Because I, I have fun. tried getting it to write questions for Lego Serious Play and Super Connect, but it hasn't worked, which made me feel better because I was like, okay. Yeah, no, I felt AI awful. I was like, wow, now. like I am now, <laughs> like, you know, and there's just a bigger intelligence in the room. But, but, you know, my ego is slightly dented, but that's okay. Or the bigger intelligence <laughs> is, is the collective intelligence, yes. maybe, right? Totally. Yeah. The collective human intelligence. Final question. Who inspires you? Who do you think, like, who do you look to for inspiration? Maybe it's authors, maybe it's people in the Lego field. What, Who or what inspires you and keeps you going? Well, that's a really good question. Who inspires me? Hmm. I because and it's hard for me to answer because I feel inspired by so many people mm-hmm. all the time and so many things all the time. I'm constantly just so like, just getting pick a couple like <laughs> the go to perfectionism. <laughs> it's not like we pick by couple, by naming yeah. one person you're leaving you're sort of denying that the other people inspire you. This is just a sample of all the things and people that inspire you. Well, right now I've just started reading like literally three pages into The Artist's Way. Mm, which, um... So good. Julia Cameron. <laughs> yes. I have just so... started doing my morning pages again. <laughs> okay. So there so you go. Good. So there's some synchronicity yep. there. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's interesting because the algorithms again showed me that. It was like, you need to mm. need to do this. Um, let's see what else. And for the people who are like, who are like what the what hell are these women talking about? <laughs> uh, Julia Cameron, The Artist's Way, It I think it's already, is it 40 years old? I mean, it's really, yes, it's, it's, it's been it's around quite, forever. It's a classic, yeah. And it works so well. I mean, and it talks about morning pages, like journaling in the morning. It's a, a specific thing. I'm not going to go into it, you know, too much. Look it up on the internet. Um, and also super fun thing called artist date, which is such a great thing. Like you have to basically have playtime with yourself at least once a week and do something that utterly delights you, whether it's going to the pound store and just buying, uh, you know, the stuff to, to blow bubbles or going to a museum, whatever rocks your boat. And to me, it's such a great way to like stay energized and inspired and all the things. I love it. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to switch this up and I'm going to, I'm going to go from who to what inspires me. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, another thing that I'm really loving right now is uh, there's a set of cards or it's a it's a game, but it's really a set of cards called 
we're no longer, we're not strangers anymore. Huh. And they're really, really good questions. And they have a couple's version as well, then the expansion pack and a family version. But they're really great questions for you to get to know um, another person. Mm. Without and, it being like super icky, because my brain is also like, oh, that sounds horrible. Well, there's As there's different like, layers. There's level okay, one, good. level two, level three. So like you can <laughs> like go up or go down in the level of intimacy, um, which I love. I think that's really yeah. great. Um, Esther Perel has a set of cards that have come out as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's called Where Where Do We Begin? Um, but unfortunately, the shipping to Australia is like as much as the cards. It's like more than $100. Ah, it's so hard, so right? Is this it with Europe? Yeah. yeah. Distribution of card decks. So that, yeah, it gets a bit. Um, if there's a reasonable. genius listening to this podcast who can solve <laughs> card deck distribution and make it sort of more <laughs> equitable across the globe, please get in touch. <laughs> And um, I think also in another thing that's really inspiring me is it's a movement in Australia right now. Um, so there's going to be a referendum um, on the voice of Parliament. So basically having an Indigenous voice be written into the Constitution, mm-hmm. so closer to what's happened in New Zealand. Yeah. Um, where so my I'm actually a, a Kiwi as well as a Canadian, and so my right. New Zealand passport is in English and Maori. Um, so Amazing. having more things like that in Australia, um, and so that's a big discussion going on right now. Um, I personally don't think if you're not Indigenous, you should vote on it. I think it should be only Indigenous people who get to decide if they want that. But apparently yeah. 80% of Australian or 80% of Indigenous people in Australia do want it. So I, I think that that's something that we need to be voting yes on. Um, but that that the fact that that's happening and it's well overdue, that step towards healing and reconciliation. So that's inspiring yeah. me. Um, a lot of amazing people really advocating for that and supporting that and um, and uh, just really, it, it can be a very, it shouldn't be, but a very contentious topic, but just, you know, bringing a lot of explaining emotionally, intellectually why it's important. Yeah, um, and so probably that, patience, that, right? And yeah, yeah, really yeah. Patient. yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah, and compassion. So that's that's another thing that's inspiring me is that movement, and, and um, I think we have, they haven't announced a date yet, but it should be sometime in October that we'll be voting. So, right. yeah, a few things Fingers inspiring closed. me right now. Yeah, good. All right, where can people find you, and what can they find you <laughs> for? Because I I think it's more than one thing. <laughs> I'm guessing. Yes. So uh, just my website, which is my my name, katerainsgoldie.com. And I do speaker coaching and strategy and business coaching for people who work with Lego Serious Play or probably just that will probably be expanded to people who do things differently. Um, and also um, training for Lego Serious Play and Super Connect, which will be online, as I mentioned, and of course, launching that new business up next, which will be taking this more globally and adding in mental health first aid and all the tools to work better and more safely with people. So good. So fun. I'll leave links in the show notes so people can just click them so much easier. Thank you so much. I mean, we could talk like another three hours (laughs) just about Lego and maybe we will someday. (laughs) Right. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.